The white-tailed deer is not only one of the most fascinating animals in North America, it's one of the most adaptable. Just like any other game animal, white-tailed deer are born in equal numbers as far as male and female. But did you know that the condition of a deer and or the condition of the habitat can greatly affect whether or not that doe has boys or girls? The white-tailed deer is not only one of the most fascinating animals in North America, it's one of the most adaptable, especially of all the big game animals. And what we found through decades of research is that the white-tail can not only adapt to its environment based off of what man is doing to the landscape, it can also adapt to its population dynamics. And that means how many males and females make up that population. And what we found through research is absolutely fascinating. One of the topics that we find most fascinating is sex ratios among white-tailed deer. How many males and how many females make up that population? Now, when you look at any animal species in the wild, including the white-tailed deer, if everything, all things being equal, the number of males and females entering that population every year is gonna be about even. We're looking at about half males and half females born into the population. However, what we've learned through decades of research is that the white-tailed deer can change its population dynamic to better suit its environment. One of the leading researchers on the subject of white-tailed gender ratios is Dr. Steven Ditchkoff. Dr. Ditchkoff is a professor in the School of Forestry and Wildlife Sciences at Auburn University and has been conducting research on white-tailed deer for over 25 years. What we find is that sex ratios generally are approximately 50-50 across the landscape, but there's increasing amounts of data that indicate that individual females do have the ability to control what the sex of their offspring are. They're not producing 100% males or 100% females, but they might be producing 60% males versus 40% females. And the factors that we're seeing influence that are number one is condition, but number two, we're also finding that the timing of conception is important. Early conceptions, which is gonna to lead to an early birth 200 days later, is going to produce an offspring that has more time for growth before winter. So if you were ever gonna produce a male offspring, it's better to do it with early births and give those fawns a jump start on life and potentially produce that super buck down the road that's gonna breed a lot. If you're gonna have a late born fawn, you, it's better to, to invest in female offspring at that time because they're gonna be behind at the start and it's very difficult to catch up later in life. Coming up, we summarize two competing theories about why one sex may be produced over another. And then Dan explains a practical approach at applying this knowledge while on a management shotgun hunt in Illinois. Land of Whitetail is brought to you by environmental conditions, as well as timing, plays a role in determining the fetal sex allocations amongst white-tailed deer. But one of the specific environmental factors that would encourage the production of one sex over the other. So there are two dueling hypotheses on this matter. On one hand, we have a hypothesis called the Trivers-Willard effect, and that centers specifically on the animal itself. On the other hand, we have one called the local resources competition hypothesis, and that focuses on the environment itself. We're gonna talk about both of those. The Trivers-Willard hypothesis was designed to explain sex ratio variation in wildlife. 
Um, Trevor Willard hypothesis predicts that a female in good condition should produce male offspring, whereas a female in poor condition should produce female offspring. The foundation of this hypothesis is based upon the variation in future reproductive success of both adult males and adult females. Adult females are all pretty standard in terms of reproductive success. They all tend to produce fawns and there's not a lot of variation from one female to the next. In contrast, males have high variation in reproductive success. Dominant males have produce a lot of fawns, um, subordinate males produce very few fawns. And so there's a lot of variation there. Trivers-Willard hypothesis predicts that a female should invest in male fawns when she's in good condition. When she's in good condition, she's able to produce a lot of milk and as a result, really give that fawn a jump start on life. This is the time when she has the greatest potential to, to positively influence how that fawn is going to be later in life. She has the potential to produce that super buck when she's in good condition. So if the theory predicts when she's in good condition, produce a male fawn, produce lots of milk, and you have the potential to produce that super buck that could have a lot of offspring. When she's in poor condition, that is not the time to try and produce that super buck. That is the time to cash in your chips and just, I'm gonna produce a female fawn that I know is gonna reproduce. Local resource competition hypothesis is a hypothesis that was developed a number of years ago that tries to explain how females should invest in their offspring. Should they produce male offspring or should they produce female offspring? And essentially, the hypothesis says this. When conditions are poor, a female should produce the dispersing sex. When conditions are good, she should produce the sex that does not disperse. In white-tailed deer, males are the dispersing sex. So when conditions are poor, the local resource competition hypothesis predicts that a female is gonna produce males. When those males disperse, there's potential for them to go to a new area, but it's also they're not gonna compete with their mothers for resources when conditions are poor. If conditions are good, she should produce female offspring that are going to establish home ranges that overlap hers and stay with her later in life. And there's probably a good indication that the resources are going to be there for them to compete for those resources. So you can drive yourself pretty crazy as a hunter and especially a land manager trying to get your hands around these various dueling hypotheses. What I like to do is incorporate bits and pieces of that because I know that if I'm taking a scientific approach to my doe management, it's going to help things in the long run rather than just going out there and doing whatever I want. Now when we're managing a certain property, especially one that's overprescribed, we're going to try to target deer of certain age classes, especially does, and that's going to help our management efforts for those given properties. So we're hunting in Illinois, the famous Golden Triangle, probably the best land in North America for managing whitetails. I'm hunting with my buddy, Steve Bartilla. Steve is a master land manager, but he needs help here. So when we look at this environment, we have large doe groups, a lot of matriarchs in there, a lot of second tier mothers in there. So you have deer that are established, which really affects your buck hunting because when you have older segments of does, they are going to dictate which bucks are going to be living there year round. So what we'd like to do in this hunt that you're going to see here, I'm targeting a year and a half old doe. This is a first time mother. We know this is a doe that we want to take out because this doe has not established a real core range yet. So what we'd like to do is we like to keep those older mothers intact that doesn't fracture anything in that community of that whitetail herd. It's going to keep things pretty much in harmony and it's going to let us take off those surplus deer off the landscape. Get that, 
First morning, perfect conditions, no weather coming in on us, so we don't have to worry about rain or none of that stuff, no wind, perfect conditions, and perfect food source. We have corn, it's about to be harvested, a couple rows have already been picked, and first thing, here comes some deer out of the woods. Exactly what I wanted, a nice year and a half old doe with a fawn, no problem with that fawn, it's late November, that thing's going to be well on its way to surviving the winter, and I have a nice doe for the freezer, as we like to say, standing there right in front of me. That's 97. She's gonna step out at 97, but she might just come straight up to us here. Okay, she was a little bit quartering too when I bleeded. I wasn't too worried about that. I'm hunting with a slug gun. I know I'm gonna be right on the money with that thing. My shot was on, but I'll tell you what, I was very surprised in how far she ran. She made it across the field and across the creek into the woods. But when we got out there, my goodness, you know, that Hornady the SST bullet really did a job because that blood was immediate and it was everywhere. Okay, here's a little tip that I know we've talked about before, but when you're looking at blood, look at the spray and see the fingers of the spray. That's almost always gives you the direction that the deer was running. So if you only have one drop of blood and you see that spray, that's how you follow it. Wow, she made it a little ways. Oh, that's a nice doe. That's a beautiful doe, look at that. Wow, she's bigger than I thought. What a beautiful deer, my goodness. Dear Lord, thank you for this wonderful day. Thank you for this wonderful gift. May this doe's body nourish our bodies, and may her memory nourish our souls. To this we pray through Jesus' name, amen. You know, I'm never going to apologize for hunting does because it is necessary. And let's face it, it's a lot of fun. But when you apply a little bit of science to it, especially when you know how those does, how they have their fawns, and how that sex ratio can be affected, by not only the condition of the deer themselves, but the condition of the habitat, that makes whitetail hunting and land management even that more enjoyable and satisfying. Way to get things started here in Illinois. Land of Whitetail is brought to you by All ready to go you know aim small miss small that's always in my head whenever I'm bow hunting whether it's compound bow hunting or crossbow hunting but that changes a little bit and my attitude towards it changes depending upon how far that shot is with today's new technology these new crossbows especially you can add 10 20 30 or even more yardage 
to your effective range. So does that mean I just go out there and aim at the same spot? No, I do not. Especially, I just shot a doe with, this is a new 10 point Havoc RS440. It's brand new for 2021. I was one of the first people to shoot it and I shot a doe here last week. And I shot that deer at 50 yards, I'll admit that. That's one of the longer shots I've taken. And the reason why I was able to do that is yes, the technology is great. These things are spot on and lightning fast, 440 feet per second. But I adjust my aiming a little bit. That deer still needs to be calm. It needs to be broadside and I have to aim small, but I'm not aiming at the same spot as I would on those slam dunk shots at 20 and 30 yards. I move that aiming point out a little bit because I know that deer can duck, that happens, especially, you know, the speed of sound, you do the calculations, a deer's out there 50 or 60 yards, a lot can happen with just a little bit of movement. So for me, you know, if I go back to when I started bow hunting, we always said, if you could put 10 out of 10 in a paper plate, you were good to go, no matter what distance you were. Well, if I'm shooting 50 yards and beyond, it has to be better than that. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna aim a little bit outside that pocket, you know, right by the, right behind the leg, a little bit to the far end of it, maybe an inch, inch and a half, and a little bit lower. It sounds like a really small difference, but it makes a big difference if that deer moves just a little bit. And with today's technology, I know I'm still gonna be in the kill zone and have enough kinetic energy to put that deer down quickly and humanely. This is one of the new Cuddy Link cameras. If you're not familiar with the Cuddy Link system, this is really unique. So a lot of people are talking about cameras that are cellular based. The Cuddy Link system, the original one here, is not cell based. Basically what you can do is you can put out numerous cameras. Now the original system, you could put out 16 cameras and they'd all speak to each other. They've improved it now up to 24 cameras off that system. You can cover a lot of ground with that. What I mean by that is you have one home camera and all those other cameras, they could be within a mile. It depends upon where you're at. For me, they've been working really good up to a half a mile, especially through woods like this. And those cameras speak to each other. Basically, if that camera takes a picture, it will send it to the home camera. So I only have to check that one camera. New for this year, they have a software update, which really expands the capacity of this system. 50% faster performance, 50% more images, up to 1,500 images per day if the link is only one or two links away from the home camera. That's important. What I can do with these cameras now with that software update is I can check everything remotely. I could go to the one camera, check everything from home. I can check battery levels. I can check connectivity. I can turn cameras on and off. All sorts of really cool things I can do. So much packed into this system that I can't tell you about it all. You're gonna to have to go online and check it out for yourself at cuttyback.com.